Hey everybody, thanks so much for, for joining me today. I'm Jamie Newirth, I lead the startup team at Anthropic. Um, this is my first time at Slush, and I don't know about you guys, but I'm already ready to come back. I already saw the 2025 dates out there. I've already been to sauna, I've jumped into the gulf in four degree water, and I've gotten stuck in the snow and the darkness at eight in the morning. So I feel like I am uh, you know, a proper fin and, and ready to return. So excited again to be here today. Um, between myself and my team, I think that we talk to probably 50 new AI native startups on a monthly basis. Honestly, it could be weekly basis, and it sometimes feel like a daily basis. So a lot of people ask me when this foundational tools like generative AI, so many companies are building on top of them, how do you get an edge? What is the moat that you can have when so many companies are able to leverage the same powerful tools? So, my opportunity leading a startup team gives me that unique advantage of being able to see what some of the fastest growing startups are doing to get and stay ahead. So I'm excited to share some of those insights with you today, as well as give you a little bit of peek into what Anthropic's research team is thinking about heading into 2025. Oh, oh sorry about that. There we go. A little bit of background for those who don't know that much about Anthropic. We're actually a relatively new company um, building foundation models as a research lab uh, focused on trust and safety. We've been very fortunate that a lot of our co-founders came from a variety of other research labs and were some of the pivotal members on the original research papers that kind of created this generative AI boom that we're in today. Anthropic's also been very fortunate to be able to leverage not only our founders and some of the folks on the team to build what third parties have said is the best LLM twice in 2024. So we're really excited to talk about these different releases as well as how can you guys make sure you're leveraging these tools because as you can see, it's kind of complicated. There's a lot of different lines here. They're start, these are different companies and they're leapfrogging each other. So how can you stay ahead when this is happening? kind of on a pretty frequent basis. So thinking about building what's next and building on the frontier is not easy. As I just shared, you're seeing that leapfrog. It feels like every day, maybe on Twitter, there's some new thing that's come out, some new capability, some new model, some new foundational model company you hadn't heard about from, yes since, uh, you know, from yesterday. And so how can you make sure that you are staying on top of these things? In particular, when model capabilities are improving at a rapid pace rarely seen in the history of software development. So building to get an edge is about a couple of things. One is speed. It's very important that if we and other foundation model companies are launching and iterating this quickly to be able to match some of that speed and that pace. The second is ev evals, evaluations. I'm gonna go into some of those and what the best practices are for the companies that are getting and staying ahead of the curve. And then prompting. Something you've probably all talked about a lot over this last year, I actually find that it is a much more relevant and important topic than people think a lot of people say, oh, it's been solved. We know how to do prompt engineering. I think a lot of that is generally accurate, but I would say that there's some really key things to help build that scaffolding and that infrastructure so you as a startup can get and stay ahead of your competition. Some organizations are already doing this really well. Some have very advanced eval suites. Some have very advanced prompting techniques, but I do still find that we're talking to companies all the time that wrote some prompts and maybe natural language 12, 18, six months ago, and are still using those today. And they try to use different models that say, you know, Twitter says this is the best new thing. Why is it not working for me? And a lot of it has to do with that infrastructure and that scaffolding to be able to manage your LLM ecosystem. So here's how it's working for some top startups today. And we're gonna start with a pretty cool thing that we released just a couple of weeks ago called computer use. So computer use is actually Claude's ability to take control of your computer and make actions on your behalf with the model. So that can range from, hey Claude, can you, you know, do my holiday shopping on Amazon, to pretty complex agentic workflows for companies like Cognition or Replit who are building these coding use cases where they're actually saying, Hey, Claude, can you go and write this code and actually make this determination and make this click for us? So why did I share about computer use? Yes, it's exciting. It's something that, that I hope a lot of you check out. But 
the reason why companies like a Cognition or Replit are able to launch and test so quickly is because they've set up that scaffolding and that infrastructure to take something that is brand new and deploy it in sometimes hours, sometimes days. And that is a way to make sure when your competition has the same access to the same models that you do, that you can make sure you're creating that moat. You can make sure that you are building the right things for your customers as quickly as possible and getting it out into the market. That infrastructure is really, really important for that rapid development. So I'm going to start with evals. Maybe raise a hand. Who has, so like, feels confident in their eval suite today? Not too many folks. That comes up more often than I thought. It's really interesting. Having a core eval suite enables you to take advantage of when a new model comes out, when a new capability comes out, and say, you know what? Everyone's saying this is state of the art. What, what is this? Why don't I try it out? Hey, I actually tested it. This doesn't work for me. Or maybe this does work for me. But you need to be able to test that out and not just say what Twitter is doing. Oh, I got to go to the new model. So what does an eval actually do? It's a way that it helps you determine how quickly and how confidently the team can iterate on the LM powered product. Meaning, is this the right model for us? Is it the right capability for us? So there's a couple ways to do this. And I'm going to go through some examples of that and go through best practices among each one. So the first is evals by humans. So maybe this seems quite obvious, but you want to write a output what you want the model to actually say or do when you ask it a query. And the best way to determine if it actually did what you wanted to do is have a human grade that. So there's advantages and there's disadvantages to this. A pro is that it's trusted grading. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe it's some experts. It's, you know, the, you can have a conversation of, does, is the model doing what we want it to do? The downside is it can be expensive. And it also takes a lot of time. So maybe you're in the legal field, and you need to get actual lawyers to say, hey, is this the right way to do this? Do you want to do that every time you're thinking about moving to a new model, or every time there's a new cap excuse me, capability? Probably not. So there's, again, pros and cons to this. Thinking about A-B testing as well. I'm going to share some examples of that in a little bit. But there's some really interesting ways that you can put these evals and put the different tests in front of your customers and have them tell you, hey, is this state of the art? Is this the frontier model that, or the capability that I want the product that I'm using to have? I'll go into that in, in just a little bit. The next is actually evaluations by computers. So maybe this seems quite obvious, but doing evals by code. There's the quantitative method here, which is, is the model correct? Effectively, is, you know, it's just math. Did it do the right thing, or did it do the wrong thing? There's a lot of advantage to that as well, of course. The biggest thing is speed. You can put in a new model and say, OK, I've been on this model for a little bit. Everyone's talking about this one now. Does this actually work for me? So you have those fast iteration cycles. You can do things like classification, where it's easy to apply some of those standard measurements on top of it. The downside, though, is that there's a lot of nuance to grading that doesn't always fit with what you're trying to do when you're just letting it be captured by code. So again, pros and cons, but you don't want to just say, OK, right or wrong, yes, great, I'm going to put this new model into production tomorrow. One of the coolest ways, and I'll share another example of that in a moment, is letting the LLM be a judge. So don't feel like you need to do this on your own. You can actually leverage LLMs to help run your eval suite for you and make sure that you have that fast iteration cycle. So again, when something new is coming out, you're saying, OK, I've already built this suite. I have the scaffolding. I have the infrastructure. Now Quad or whichever model you're leveraging, actually do this test for me on my behalf. I'll get into that a little bit and some cool use cases for that. This is my favorite, because I think this is what most people are actually doing when they're looking at different models. It's evals by vibes. It's cool, everyone's talking about this thing on Twitter. This new model has come out. It's all the rage right now. I'm just going to put in like five or 10 different prompt examples. And I'm just going to take a mental note of, hey, does this sound good? Does this look good? Is this the thing that I want to be using? I think a lot of people still do evals by vibes. And the pro is that it's extremely fast. 
you can get something, you can get access to it in minutes sometimes when it's available, and you're actually just typing in a couple of examples going, wow, this sounds a lot better. This is great. I should definitely be using this. Let me unplug one model and plug another in. That's not always the best way to do things, because you're not really having that quantitative, excuse me, that, qua yes, that quantitative rigor to make sure that does it work for all the different nuances of your product. And what you don't want to run into is a competitor using more thorough eval methods that are actually taking time to say, OK, one, maybe this model isn't for us. Or two, I'm actually going to use different pieces of these models for different aspects of my workflow. That I see as some of the most complex, some of the fastest growing startups leveraging generative AI today are using different models in different places. And so when you do evals by vibes, you're kind of flying blind. So it makes things a little bit more complicated. But a lot of projects you know, start by vibes. I think one of our you know, applied AI team uh, internally like to say that hackathons are like a bug bash is vibes at scale. So you're doing a lot of work, you're spending a lot of time on this, and you're having a lot of folks say, yes, this is a great new model. We should think about using this in these different places. But it's still not that thorough in how you actually want to test the model and make sure that it's going to be the right one for you. Because the way that I always think about this is when my team or myself are talking to a lot of startups, there's a lot of folks doing somewhat similar things on top of these models. So again, how do you stick out? How do you know that this is the right place for me or the right capabilities for me to start to move on, given that so many new products, so many new models are launching all the time? So some examples with that. There's ways to do A-B evals with your customers. And there's a really cool rubric that from Apollo that I'll share as well, where they're actually leveraging an LLM to help them with their grading. So Apollo is a great tool for, generally used for sales reps um, and sales teams, marketing. And one of the ways that they're leveraging Claude is actually to help sales, uh, sales reps generate emails and send those out. And so how do you know that it's a good email? How do you know that one model does it better than the other? And how do you know that it's an email that someone is actually going to respond to? So what they did is they wrote what's called the golden output. They put together what, in their mind, is the perfect sales email, which I would love to have. So I hope to see their golden output one day. Um, it's the perfect email, and they actually score every part of the email with a different rubric for grading. So they'll have the call to action, the introduction, the conclusion, what is the meat of the email. And one thing that's really important is that they have a rubric from one to five. A lot of people overcomplicate this, and they actually make it harder for the model to do what it's really good at. And so they'll put a rubric of 1 to 100, or they'll do 1 to 10. Telling a model, hey, score this a 6. Here's what a 6 is, and here's what a 7 is, or here's what a 98 is versus what a 99 is, is actually a little bit too much information. However, it's a lot clearer for the model to understand 5 out of 5 is perfect. Four out of five is really good. We might want to use this. Three out of five, actually, this is kind of a failing grade. Two and one are definitely failing. And so what they do is they have the golden output in that email. They have those different rubrics. And then they're sending the model with their eval flows hundreds and hundreds of examples of different emails and seeing which model is actually scoring the highest based on this rubric. So again, they're able to do that quite rapidly, quite iteratively, when new capabilities come out, because they have that eval suite set up, they have that rubric what they feel really confident in, so they're spending a lot of time on that golden output. That's a lot of times your secret sauce as a startup. You know something that I don't know, that your competitor doesn't know, and why your product is going to be the best. So then how do you get the model to work for you? That's one of the really good ways to do it. Another is just ask your customers. What do the customers want to see? Again, in this world where a lot of folks are leveraging very similar tools, how do you make sure you can stick out with your customers? And if you want to change the model or you want to add a new capability, when you're doing it on a sometime like three-month iterative cycle as these models are coming out so frequently, how do you know that it's actually going to work for you and that your customers are going to like it?
there's a couple startups that my team works with that are in the content or lyric generation uh, uh, space. And so they're putting things out there for consumers, which means that there are very specific nuances that someone might like when you're saying, hey, write me a song, or write me this comic book, or tell me this story. If you change out a model, sometimes for whatever reason, it just like looks a little bit different. Or sometimes it sounds a little bit different. You can't quite put your finger on it. Who's going to do that better than your customers? So, so what they do is when, uh, you know, when the recent 3.5 Sonnet version 2 came out a couple months ago, or about a month ago, excuse me, what they did was they actually A-B'd with their customers. So they sent two different outputs when their customer said, hey, write me a song or tell me, you know, you know, write me this story. They actually offered for a period of time in a random subset of customers two options. And then they were able to see how many customers clicked on option A or option B. If option B, let's say, was Sonnet 3.5 and that was selected the most, that enables them to say, this is state of the art for us, this is the right thing for our customers, and this is how we're going to move forward with these new capabilities. So it's two pretty cool ways to think about that rubric, letting the LLM do a lot of the work for you, and then again, Sometimes it seems obvious, but it can be a little bit scary, but sometimes just ask your customers. So what are the keys to success when thinking about evals? A lot of it depends on your business goals. There is no right or wrong answer here. There is no obvious yes or obvious no. Everything has a pro and a con. Typically, a blend of techniques is really helpful. Even vibes, I do recommend a little bit of vibe check when, when thinking about evals and these outputs, but don't just depend on that. And then prompt engineering, which I'm going to get into in a little bit. The importance of that is the beginning part of the infrastructure of your scaffold for that successful eval suite. Because what you want to do is spend actually a bit more time on this than you might think so you can do that rapid iteration. I was meeting with a user yesterday, this amazing company based out of Stockholm, and they were telling me that they actually, at a company of 25 people, they have three engineers who when a new model comes out, it is actually, they are tasked to drop what they're doing and use their very complex eval suite to test the new model. Because a lot of times startups tell me, they say, I don't have time to do this all the time. You know, like, I need a full-time person thinking about this. We need to be building over here. I think my answer and my response to that is what I see is the fastest growing startups, native AI companies, really spend a lot of time on evals and they actually will drop everything when the time is right to test out new capabilities and to test out when new models come out. So it is something that I find to be extremely important in getting that edge and staying ahead. Build that scaffolding and infrastructure early on because it's going to pay off dividends. And so thinking of prompting as well, why is prompting still coming up? Why are we still talking about prompting? And it's something that I see all the time is companies wrote their prompts, again, 6, 12, sometimes 18 months ago, and they haven't changed them since. And they say, hey, everyone on Twitter is talking about this really great model. Why isn't it working for me? Or, hey, I'm going to switch to different foundation model companies. Everyone on Twitter says this is really good, and I see all these evals, and you're saying it's the best in the world. This kind of sucks. Like, what, what's going on here? It's because... One, different models prompt very differently. And two, setting up that infrastructure, that scaffolding again for the prompts is just as important as the evals. Engineering a prompt is actually pretty complicated. And again, I go back to a lot of folks have just typed in with natural language a while ago, this is, the, what, this is what I want you to do, model. Please do this. So you need to develop your test cases. You need to engineer some of those you know, uh, preliminary prompts. You need to then test it against different cases. That was the eval suite comes in. Then you have to test it against other eval. It's, yeah, I kind of go, can go on and on here. It, there's a lot more to it. So what does a good prompt look like and, and how can you actually get there? There's a lot of folks who spend a lot of time on this. There's third parties that, that help you manage this. One thing that's pretty cool that, that we've been able to help a lot of startups with is we just call it the prompt generator. So you can actually put in, in natural language, this is the prompt that I'm hoping, you know, that I'm looking for. This is the output that I'd like the model to have. And what we're going to do is actually help you understand what goes into that prompt and build it on your behalf. So you put something in a natural language and you get a structure that looks like this. 
sentences for the roles that you want the model to play, dynamic content, detailed examples. Sometimes prompts need really detailed examples, sometimes they don't. So that's where there isn't just a yes, no with prompt engineering. Sometimes you actually need to think a little bit more iteratively with these prompts. And with actually, we released this just last week, funny enough, or actually it might, might have been Monday, is prompt improver. So you can put in a prompt like this and say, hey, I'm not getting what I'm looking for. What can I do better? And Claude is actually going to help you directly improve the prompt. Sometimes it's easy, like, hey, add five examples. One isn't enough. Sometimes it's, you're being too verbose, Claude. How do I get to the stop? Just tell Claude to stop being so verbose. It's actually that easy sometimes, but we've actually created something to help you make that process a little bit faster, and again, enable you to have that foundation and that scaffolding so you can move really quickly. Speaking of moving quickly, one thing that comes up a lot of uh, uh, times is the fine-tuning question. Should I fine-tune, or what do I do to fine-tune, or do I need to fine-tune? And I think the answer to a lot of things related to foundation models and generative AI is maybe. It depends on your use case, depends on your business need. But what I do find is a lot of startups come to us saying we need to fine tune, we have to, this is our secret sauce, and this is how we're gonna get ahead. And sometimes that's totally true. Sometimes that's very accurate. You wanna make the model follow a specific format or tone? Yeah, I would probably fine tune. But there are some downsides to that. One is the time it takes. The other can be the cost. So what you don't want to do is spend a month going through a fine tuning run, and then all of a sudden, the new state of the art model comes out. If you remember from that original chart that I had, sometimes it happens on a monthly basis, it feels like. So does fine tuning help in every use case and scenario when you're trying to really just get the output to be, excuse me, the model to have more accurate outputs? The answer is maybe, and that prompting a lot of the time can be more impactful. Having really good prompts, being able to iterate on those prompts, sometimes is the thing that's going to move the needle for you more than fine tuning. So you can see here some of these ways that the likelihood of success with prompting and sometimes with RAG as well can be quite high and kind of in that medium sense of, yeah, if you want to teach the model a new skill, fine tuning actually is like maybe not the way to do that. The level of complexity there, the time and the cost can actually be quite high but really good prompting is actually gonna get you most of the way there. So this is something that you, know, you can work with Quad on, you can work with other foundation model companies on, but I really recommend having that really strong prompt technique and make that kind of a lifeblood of the company similar to evals. That's what's gonna help you get and stay ahead when all of this is changing, again, seemingly on a weekly basis. So thinking of that as well, you know, where is Anthropic headed where are we spending time going into the new year? What are some of the things that our research team is pretty focused on? We're really excited about a lot of these aspects. So one, you can see that with some of our, uh, with computer use that just came out, but that agents and orchestration layer. I think there's gonna be a lot more long, kind of chain of thought type agentic workflows. And with computer use, now you can actually have the agent make a decision or excuse me, make an actual action on your behalf. So how do we make that even better? How do we make it go more longer context from that perspective is definitely something we're thinking about. You know, spending a lot of time on pre-training, of course, and what is the best way to like think about these new models. But to me, probably the most exciting is interpretability. We came out with a paper a couple months ago, I actually I guess might, might have been in the spring or early summer, about mechanistic interpretability, where we actually, for the first time ever, were able to see a little bit inside of the brain of Quad, of the LLM, and understand when it was making a decision or when it was saying a specific thing, what were the neurons that were firing in Quad, and can we actually interpret and maybe an, uh, manipulate some of those neurons ourselves to make the model act and think a little bit differently. It's almost like, can you fine tune it by just like having a couple lever, levers or knobs? I don't know if anyone saw this, but it was when that paper came out, we actually turned Claude to, into thinking it was the Golden Gate Bridge. And so we, ha we gave folks access to play around with Quad AI, um, thinking that it was you know, this bridge in San Francisco, um, because we were able to turn up or down some of the neurons within Quad. So really exciting things that we think are going to actually be really impactful for startups that enable you to leverage some of these interpretability, the insights that we have, how can we pass that on to you, or how can you actually have a model yourself that you can kind of be more 
interpretable and enable you to again get and stay ahead when a lot of your when a lot of your uh, you know competitors have access to this as well. So what are some of the takeaways here? Outside of where we're going next, how can you make sure that you're getting and staying ahead? One is speed. I've never been in an industry that moves this quickly and there's so many new launches all the time. It, it feels like you can never rest, you can never get sleep on one model because the next one's coming out relatively soon. And to me, that's just exciting. But yeah, it makes things a little bit more complicated when you're trying to develop software and, and put it out to customers. But speed is the name of the game. Being able to match that and make sure that you are getting ahead of your competitors is really important. And doing that is with evals as well that scaffolding, that infrastructure. How can you make sure you can test something? Is it state of the art, yes or no? Do I want to put this in front of my customers, yes or no? Doing that on a rapid base is really, really important. And the next, again, prompting. Making sure that you have a really strong foundation for prompting and have that scaffolding set up so you can make the tweaks and you can feel really good about when your prompts are solid you put them in your evals, you're moving really fast, and you can make sure that you're deploying amazing products for your customers to help get and stay ahead. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate you taking the time.